Okay, that's the last one we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Les and Leslie. Bless you. And um, yeah, walk by faith when we leave today. Walk by faith when we came in as well, didn't we? It was good. Marvellous. So it's a really warm welcome to everybody here today. A cracking welcome to everybody online as well. You're really, uh, we, we're really pleased that you're joining us today. Um, and with that, I want to thank the technical people, uh, people like Sam, the people who are ringing us in, that call to worship today through what's been a very stormy weekend. And hey, praise the Lord. As a church, we've got off pretty, pretty lightly with uh, any damage. You might have noticed a couple of tree boughs down. It would have hurt if it hit you. Fortunately, nobody got, got injured at all. Um, so we thank Les and Leslie today as well, um, leading our, our music. And for Chris come to bring God's word to us as well so um, the only thing I think that we've noticed that's a little bit funny is the flag is now blowing at an odd angle we've got to, we've got to get a cable replaced but um, that'll happen in due course so let's, uh, let's just spend a moment in silence before I read some bands Father God, thank you that you're here today with us. Thank you that no matter where we are, you are. Because you live in our hearts. If we've given our lives to you. We bless you today, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, I have some bands of marriage to read, and there was also a couple, of, um, a couple of words given just before the service as well. And I think it's appropriate to, um, to give those words in a moment. We'll, we'll, we'll do these bands of marriage though first. Um, and the bands of marriage are published between uh, Wesley William Freeman and Kimberly Ann Elliott. Um, they are both of this parish. They are both single. This is for the first time of asking. And if anyone knows any cause or impediment why these two people shouldn't be joined together in holy matronry, we need to declare it now. So let's just pray for them at the start of the service here. Father God, we thank you for Wesley and for Kim. Thank you, Lord, for all that they are to us over in breakfast at nine. And Lord, we ask that you would bless them immensely today as they are preparing for their wedding in a few, few, few months' time. Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, with their families, Lord. Give them your peace, your understanding, and bless their marriage together. Amen. Amen. I feel like I need an extra table here today, but there we are. 
So there were a couple of um, couple of words given this morning that are, are really important. Um, th- that these words may be for people online as well, and if and if and if you feel that these words are for you online, then do just drop a note into the into the church office admin at camfordparish.org, or ring the office, and we can put you in touch with somebody who will pray with you. Um, Bev and, and June are very very happy to pray for people um, over the phone. So there's a word about somebody feeling lost and this comes in with another word that somebody had on the way here. They were were driving along, very happily uh, tootling along to get to church today, went to turn right into Arrowsmith Road and the road's closed. It's actually closed at both ends and it's been closed since yesterday. And they thought, oh gosh, you know, is that a word for someone? And then in the, in the time of press, somebody else, unbeknown to that situation, had this word that somebody might be feeling lost, maybe feeling they're going in the wrong direction. It's time to give your life to Christ. Or it may be that it's somebody who is, um, is a Christian, but actually we're on the wrong road. And that road's going to be closed and we need to find a new direction. Um, Another uh, word was about debris in our life that may be strewn around, that the storm comes and blows that uh, debris away, but it's Jesus in the midst of the storm that calms us, and um, he dissipates that mess, and it's Jesus in the calmness right in the midst of that storm. So those are the, the couple of words that were given this morning. So we're going to begin with the prayer on page two for people who are at home, uh, which I hope will come up on the screen. And it begins, Almighty God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. So let's confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the uh, special prayer today, uh, the collect for the second Sunday before Lent. Almighty God, you've created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own, own image. 
teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who, with you and the Holy Spirit, reigns supreme over all things, now and forever. Amen. And so we're going to uh, have the hymn that we should have had before we did all those prayers. Um, But there we are, you know. As long as you're okay with that, I'm okay with that as well. Leslie. Sorry. No, no. It's going to be and can it be, and then we'll have the reading. And that's great. Robin's Robin's going to give me our time after this. But there we are. to the verses you've got there have you got a verse that says he left his father's home above yeah, yeah. Verse two. Okay. that was verse 2 let's do it then <laughs> and then we'll go to the last verse okay <laughs> yes Yeah. <laughs> sorry everyone online he left his father's throne above so free, so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless grace. Tis mercy all immense and free for all. Mercy, all immense 
we got there. And Father God, we thank you that we can follow you. We thank you that our chains are broken when we give our lives to you. And we bless you, we praise you in worship today. Amen. Amen. So I welcome Roger to come and do our reading today. Bless you, Roger. Thank you so much for standing in. He's actually standing in for his wife, so that's okay, <laughs> isn't it? You can, you can do it up there if you like. Oh, you can do it there. Whichever's easier for you. So the reading uh, this morning is Genesis chapter 37, uh, verses 2 to 13, and then 17 to 36. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached him, reached, reached them, sorry, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern, cistern here in the wilderness, and, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, after all he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. 
Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in, in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is the, this is the, the end of the first reading. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. The end of the first and only reading. I'd be glad to know. It's a long one. Well done. It's great. It's a great. It's great storytelling, though, isn't it? Amazing. I just love. I love Genesis, but the the different sort of voices of the narrators just great. That particular one is is just full of wonderful. Yeah, it's a great storytelling thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, explore this rich narrative, reveal to us more of your ways that we might walk in the way of Jesus and so bring your kingdom to come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. Well, this week we, uh, we begin a new episode in the history of the patriarchs. Last week, Andrew did such a good job covering the whole life of Jacob that, frankly, when I looked to think about preaching on uh, what I had planned to preach on Jacob, um, I decided not to because I think it would have been a massive anticlimax. And he picked out all the points and did it brilliantly well in 20, 25 minutes. Uh, as a twin himself, I think he really hit the nail on the head, right on the head. The whole sibling rivalry thing that you get between twins, something I, of course I couldn't do. But this week is different. After scratching my head for an hour or so, my eyes strayed to the final episode in the life of the patriarchs, the story of Joseph. And therefore, the last two weeks up to Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent will be focused on Joseph. And I have a similar insight, as Andrew did with the Esau Jacob twin bit. I can empathise with Joseph, who had much older brothers. And I was the youngest, and I have to say the most spoilt of all the boys. You probably noticed this in my characteristics over the years. <laughs> Therefore, just as Andrew was qualified to speak on Jacob, I feel I have a qualification to speak on Joseph. Youngest? Well, not quite the youngest. There was one more. We'll see in a in a in a in a in a in the chart of the the, the different uh, twelve tribes of uh, of Israel. But nearly the youngest, the second youngest, the most spoilt, a bit of a dreamer, and someone who managed to avoid the household chores his brothers had to do. So this week's talk I've called Curtains for Joseph question mark as the story begins with a dream in Canaan and ends with slavery and exile in Egypt. Not a very promising start for the final 13 chapters of Genesis but we know of course because we've read this many times before that it has a very uplifting end. We're here to think about how and why he got there with God. And an uplifting story it is, very much so, because it was made into a, a famous hit musical, wasn't it, by Tim Rice and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. And we'll have the picture. This was the revival uh, of the original. Uh, is that on the picture? Yeah, that's it, yeah. The multicolored dream coat. J uh, G Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Um, uh, 
uh, which is, of course, a key feature of the story, which is Joseph's ornate robe that uh, Roger was referring to there, the so-called Technicolor Dreamcoat. Another feature uh, was the first song, Any Dream Will Do, but that was a complete misnomer, as we'll find, as it forms the basis, the dream is such an important basis of the whole Joseph narr narrative, all 11, no, sorry, 13, I can't do my maths here, 13 remaining chapters of Genesis. Joseph is different, we can do away with that now, is it gone? Yep. Joseph is different to the many offspring that Jacob spawned because first he is the offspring of the premier bloodline, Jacob and Rachel, whilst his brothers, as we saw in the first verse today, were sons of Leah and Bilpah and Zil Zil uh, Zilpah, which were Jacob's other wife and concubines. We'll have a picture of the family tree up here. I don't know if you can see that. They're the 12 tribes of Israel. You've got Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah. Then Jacob has these four wives or wives' servants. Uh, Leah and Rachel are his two wives. Of course, he was swindled in it, wasn't he, by, uh, by Laban into marrying the oldest daughter, Leah. Um, when he was really in love with Rachel. He had to wait another seven years before he could marry. But in the meantime, um, uh, he also uh, was, uh, he had given to him uh, two servants because Rachel could not conceive. Eventually, God blesses her. She does conceive. She has Joseph and Benjamin. They're the, 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 the uh, number 11 and 12 in the, uh, in, in, in the tribes of Israel. So although he is nearly the youngest, except for Benjamin, he is destined to become the ruler over his older brothers, retelling this whole narrative that's run all the way through those chapter 12 all the way through to the end of chapter 50, um, retelling the whole story of the patriarchs, where Isaac overruled Ishmael, Jacob overruled his twin Esau, and Jacob makes it worse by ordaining Joseph by clothing him in this ornate and especially expensive robe. This is saying to the other brothers, Joseph is my chosen heir. So let's first set the scene. We've covered the hierarchy, we can do away with that slide now. We've covered the hierarchy of the family as I've already said. But Joseph is a bit of a creep as well. He's a bit of a spoilt creep. He tells his father about his brother's bad behaviour whilst tending the flocks. That would not do him any good in a violent and adversarial family of many brothers. I only had two brothers, but that was enough. I ended up literally at the bottom of a large and heavy pile of masculinity as my brothers got fed up with me with their younger sibling, and painful it was too. Fortunately, we are good friends now. Now, Jacob or Israel, as he's called here, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And I s expect it was because he loved Rachel more than any of the other wives. The narrator puts it down to older age, but I know it is because the, uh, the other brothers had grown into men, all married off, and the youngest unmarried child is always going to get a bit more attention. That's what happened to me. And Jacob spoiled him as he now has plenty of money, plenty of time, and his son Joseph, by all accounts, was an intelligent and attractive character. And his brothers hated him for it. So here we have this picture of love pitched against hate. The father's love for his son and the other son's hatred for their younger son, their younger brother. And I don't want to read too much into this, but could this be a metaphor for our Heavenly Father's love for his children, focused in the person of his son Jesus, and the hatred of the religious leaders for Jesus, to such an extent they wanted to kill him too. But I'm leaping ahead. As in the story of Jesus, weak and cowardly men, manipulated by the devil, will try to wipe out the son, but they will not prevail. So is it curtains for Joseph? Let's read on. Let's talk now about dreams. At one level, this is a story about a father, a special son, and a number of jealous other sons who hate their brother. 
but there is a fourth party in this story and of course that is God and although God appears as a rather nebulous character in the form of a dream it is this dream that will run as a golden thread through the next 13 chapters of Genesis this dream becomes the present manifestation of the promise made to Abraham this dream overrules human convention and despite human intervention or resistance God's plan will always succeed isn't that reassuring folks verse 5 Jacob had a dream what is Joseph's sorry uh, Joseph had a dream what is Joseph's dream his dreams theme is about his brothers bowing down to him loosely disguised as competing sheaves of corn he follows that up in verse 9 with another dream about the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowing down to him these dreams make Joseph's brother brothers hate him even more his father wisely rebukes him to take away the sort of spoilt brat tag that was being labelled by his jealous brothers. But instinctively, Jacob knew the promise God had made to his forefathers, Abraham and Isaac, and that it was being lived out through him and through Joseph. Jacob sensed history was repeating itself, even through this annoying, frustrating, but ultimately irresistible son. So that's part one of the story. The father, the dreamer, the dream, and the jealous brothers. And so we move on to the second part of this reading. The brothers plot to kill the dreamer, and by doing so, they feel they can kill the dreams. Why should the youngest inherit their father's position? Why should they, with their father and mother, bow down to Joseph? So Jacob sends Joseph out to his brothers who are herding the flocks out in the wilderness. And of course they see him far off and they hatch a plan to do away with him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other in verse 19. Do you see how the, the forces of evil look to thwart the purposes of God by manipulating the brothers' selfish and carnal desires? As I said, if they kill the dreamer, they think they can kill the dream. But God's promises will not be thwarted. As we've seen time and time again on this series of the patriarchs, God uses even weak, vain, corrupt and self-interested men and women to achieve his plans. What can he do through us? If he can do that through them, what can he do through us? Well, anything, of course. But let's stick with the Joseph story for now. Reuben, whether moved by compassion or possibly cowardice for his half-brother, argues to spare the life of Joseph just long enough so through God's providence, a camel train of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt come onto the scene. It's interesting, isn't it? that the ones who transport Joseph to the destination God has chosen are the children not of the promise but of the other not from Isaac's tribe but from his half-brother Ishmael he is sold for 20 shekels of silver it's also interesting that Jesus was sold out by one of his adopted brothers Judas for 30 pieces of silver and imprisoned overnight probably in a prison made from a cistern if Caiaphas's house is the one they have excavated in Jerusalem on the edge of the city of David which I visited as we will see next week Joseph the one who they wanted to get rid of is ultimately the one who saves the whole family in the same way Jesus the one the religious leaders of Israel wanted to kill and get rid of is the one who saves not only a family not even a nation but ultimately the whole of humanity and for me this is what's so fascinating about this story of Joseph is the connection between this story and the Gospels of Jesus and of course we've seen it haven't we through the different characters Abraham Isaac and Jacob too so let's move on to the final third part of the story verse 29 on Reuben has been somewhere else I don't know where he doesn't say does it he wasn't aware of the sale of Joseph he goes to the system to haul him out perhaps he felt that this experience would be good enough to teach Joseph a lesson to stop him being an absolute pain but he's not there panic 
he tears his clothes in grief and contrition he's clearly put out of his misery by his brothers who tell the story of the sale into, sl into slavery they take his robe dip it in the blood of a goat and take it to their father Jacob the robe that has adorned Joseph as his unofficial enthronement to become Jacob's heir is now a sign of his dethronement by his brothers. Ha! The brothers think, he's now history. The dreamer has disappeared, and so will the dreams. A story of deep love between Jacob and Joseph has turned into a story of hate. But God will have his way. And at the end of this story is such that love triumphs over hate. Jacob tears his clothes, <coughs> puts on sackcloth and mourns his son. Love triumphs over hate. And then the final verse, I think I'm going to need to grab a glass of Then the final verse, verse 36, which is the spoiler really for the next part of this exciting and racy story. It says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. We move from Canaan, the land of promise, to Egypt, the land of the Exodus and the land of slavery. But God has not abandoned the dream, and with it his promises to Abraham. The dream continues, and it's not dependent on Jacob, or the brothers, or even Joseph. And this surely has to be a great lesson to us too. We think of ourselves in hopeless situations, and think that God has overlooked us. But Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, in John chapter 5 verse 17, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. Friends, <coughs> however hopeless our situation might be, remain hopeful because unseen God is working his purposes out. We sing, don't we? Faithful one. And we need to mean it. And in this story today, we begin with a dream, a dream of hopeful humanity. And then we move to a story of brothers who represent resistant, hopeless humanity. But next week, we will see that the dream, the promise God makes to us, that nothing, as St. Paul reminds us, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord will be fulfilled. That through Jesus and belief in him, we too have become adopted children of God, just like Abraham's offspring. And that he wants the best, the very, very best for each one of us, whether we see it or not. So, if you're feeling cut off from God today, if you're watching on live stream and maybe you're separated from the rest of the fellowship here, pray, listen and wait and be hopeful because God seems absent from Joseph as we leave this story but his purposes are being worked out perfectly under the radar and I can't wait for next week and the conclusion of the Patriarch series let's pray shall we Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you that you have given us a narrative that's not just a great story, but a narrative that speaks into our lives today. And even when we feel hopeless, or in a hopeless situation, we know there is hope. Because the promises you make will not be thwarted, not by human intervention, not by the forces of evil. That you will overcome everything and nothing can separate us from your love, from your ultimate purposes for us. You hold us 
in the palm of your hand as your treasured possessions, your treasured children, the heirs for everlasting life. Reveal that truth to us today through this narrative we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got two reflective songs. Um, I think the first one's going to be Hide Me Now, because we swapped them last night, didn't we?
take a seat folks Thank you so much, guys. <clears throat> Let's just rest in quietness for a moment. As we know, that quietness, that stillness that only comes when the Holy Spirit is with us and when the Lord Jesus is resting upon us. And we invite you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be here with us. Rest on us, Lord Jesus. Come to us and minister to us, Lord. God our Father, grant us the help of your Spirit in our prayers for the salvation of all people. We pray for the church throughout the world, for the church and all its members, for our bishops, for our leadership, for Chris and Sandra here. For all our volunteers. We pray that in faith and unity we may be constantly renewed by your Holy Spirit for mission and for service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the peoples of the world, for the leaders of the nations, especially at the moment for all the tension that we see in so many places around the world. A few weeks ago, Chris Heppenstall prayed for areas of conflict, which caused me to go and take a look online. Do you know there are 27 areas of war within our world at the moment? We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would be in the midst of the governments that, by your power, you would break into decisions that are being made. We pray that, they would, that, that, that leaders would seek justice they seek freedom and they seek peace for everyone. Lord, in your mercy, you. hear our prayer. We pray for our own country, for those who have authority and influence within government, within the House of Lords, within local authorities, within the many services that we rely upon with the National Health Service and Social Services. And we pray that there would be wisdom, honesty and compassion in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those we, uh, we live and work amongst and for our neighbours, for those who we'll just bump into during the week. We pray that we would be able to use our gifts, whether that's hospitality or just listening or maybe practical de gifts that we would be able to help further the kingdom because people see you in us Lord Jesus we heard about the uh, the leaven working through the dough over in breakfast at nine and we pray that we would be that that leaven working through our neighbourhoods Lord Jesus that we would be able to share the gospel with everyone we come across Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for all who are in sorrow or need, anxiety or sickness. And at the moment we would very much remember June Haskell. 
we'd remember Sandra and Paul Webster and the family of Wendy Wadsworth and in a moment of silence just lift anyone else to the Lord who is on your heart or in your mind at the moment We pray for everyone who in weakness may find and know your strength or in despair would find hope in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we thank you, Father, that we're one family on earth and in heaven and we give thanks for those who have died in the in the faith of Jesus for those who've revealed to us your grace in Christ help us to follow their example and bring us with them to the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen and now Chris is going to lead us in communion Thank you, David. I'm going to be using uh, prayer E today. Uh, if you're w watching on the screen, it will all appear, of course, as usual, without you needing to refer to the book. But if you are following in a book, for whatever reason, it's on page 30 of the Red Service book. So the Lord is here, Spirit is with us, lift up your hearts, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son, who on the night before he died had supper with his friends and taking bread. He praised you, he broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. And bringing before you the bread of life and cup of creation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. So great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people and gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. And so as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. And so, friends, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. upon the waters the great unknown where feet may fail <clears throat> and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand and I will call upon your above the waves my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine your grace abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide and where my feet may fail fear surrounds me you'll never fail and you won't start now and I will call upon your name keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you may call me take me deeper than my feet
feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Saviour will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you we've got today and although we do spend time praying about the songs it's often uh, they're picked beforehand um, and not changed occasionally they are but um, they always it's amazing how God seems to work together with the choice of songs and the, the theme of the service so so thank you Les and Leslie for your choice to, this week for our final um, prayer um, I just wanted to mention about David Wildman many of you will remember David and uh, he was such a character wasn't he and um, unfortunately he's he died last week and his daughter Beverly has asked us to pray in in our church for him and his family and the daughters Sally and Beverly so if you could please hold uh, David Wildman's um, family in your prayers this week I don't have the details of the uh, funeral service um, but it will be I don't know what, whether they're planning to have some of it here or, or elsewhere that's right thank you thank you yeah he's going to be buried at Broadstone so it may be that if you would like to attend that we'll we'll find out the details and publicize that we also haven't got a final date yet for Wendy Wadsworth's funeral I think it's going to be Friday the 18th of March but um, I'll, that will be confirmed tomorrow uh, with uh, with the family and the funeral directors so but pencil that in probably one o'clock on Friday the 18th of March let us pray so we say together Almighty God we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son Jesus Christ through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory amen and we're going to have our final hymn aren't we now David it is and this is the one that we were um, practicing earlier wasn't it that we were practicing earlier <laughs> what's the best way of doing this guys are you going to do the first hit the first verse again to get it into our heads or are we just going to go for just it just going to go for it going to go for it <laughs> <Be sad. laughs> yes we're great. love it we walk by faith not by sight exactly actually yeah what am I talking about <laughs> Faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In 
the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roam the earth, with the power of his promise in their hearts, of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise, we will fix our eyes on him, our souls reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By, by, by faith the prophet saw a day when the longed for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved And the power of the gospel shall prevail For we know in Christ all things are possible For those who call upon his name oh, We will stand as children of the promise and we will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. And again, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. can see that's going to become one of our favorites that so thank you for introducing it <laughs> Leslie thank you so let's uh, go with God's blessing now so may God the Holy Trinity keep you strong in faith and love defend you on every side and guide you in truth and peace and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always amen amen so go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, in the, name the name of Christ. Of Christ. Amen. 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 Do join us for coffee and refreshments over in the CMC after the service. And if you'd like any prayer ministry in, uh, for any of the, uh, the words today, we'll be having prayer ministry down in the South Chapel on request. Yes, indeed.